politicians for. How could you have such faith in any politician? You know who I back. You think I have 100% faith in the person I back? No. But he's the most likely to kick you-know-who in the you-know-whats to put them out of business once and for all. I care most about national security. Okay, there are many other issues. Now, please don't do the Cruz bots are not. Don't call me now. I know you love him. I get it. I'll vote for him if he's the winner, but I'm not talking about it. Right now we're talking about Bernie Madoff and the, the scythe he took to America. WABC, Alan, tell us your story about Madoff, please. You know, I'm an antique merchant in New York City, third generation, and post-Madoff, we were buying some of the world's greatest Judaica. You know, I bought a 16th century Hanukkah menorah from a Madoff victim. Uh, you know, just incredible stuff. Well, wait, wait, wait. Oh, so you, you bought it at a distressed price. What'd you pay for it? Well, I'll tell you what, because they had flooded the market. He single, him and the internet single handedly, uh, devaluated the Judaica market because so many of his victims were old Jews who that was their prized treasures, Mike. You know, that was the stuff. That's, well, you know, my father was a small antique dealer in New York. Where, where is your store? Are you internet or in, in, a, in a store? No, we're still slugging it out just like your dad might have. And, you know, a store is your no, no, but where, well, where is your store, though? In Manhattan? Where is it? Yeah, we're, at the, we're at the 25th Street Design Center, which is the showplace antique market. It's between 5th Avenue and... So you're saying that that's a very interesting. I'll have to visit it the next time I'm in New York and see if I can buy something that made off a swindle from somebody. What about buying? Uh, did you actually get any of the stuff that he swindled at auction? No, we didn't go to the auctions. Because... All right, this is so good. I love uh, human, you know. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Give it to the old girl, uh, Hillary. I don't know how she does it. You look at the neck. I don't know how she's handling it. The two, uh, the two oldsters there up on the stage. I mean, really, that's just what America needs right now. A commie or a criminal. That's exactly what America needs after eight years of Obama. It's unbelievable. You talk about a death spiral. He's a crackpot, but at least he's an honest crackpot. He tells you exactly how he's going to ruin America. That's the one thing why he's appealing, is he knows exactly how he's going to destroy the country, what's left of it. And he tells you, too. And one of the reasons I'm giddy is it's Super Bowl weekend, and I'm not going. And I'm not even going into the city. I'm not even going over the bridge. I have a place in the city that I go to. I haven't been there for weeks, number one. But number two, to go in, you got to be crazy. There's a million people there. So I could have gone, but I'm not going. I'm not going because I, don't, I can't sit through a game. I don't have the patience for it. The, the peanuts, it seems like the Roman arena. You know, I feel like I'm going to get crushed any minute or thrown to the lions. I don't enjoy it. It's like... To me, it's much to do about nothing. I know the whole country's involved, and everyone would love to be there. God bless you if you're interested, and I promise I will tune in for a second. But it's just not what interests me. I just don't really like sports that much. I just don't. Just don't. Wimps. First of all, wimps rule. That's something you got to know. I read an article this morning. Life after the NFL. Super Bowl hero Joe Montana can't run. Struggles with other activities. It's a sad story. It says football legend Joe Montana performed the coin to us for Super Bowl Fifty at Levy Stadium this weekend. Blah, blah, blah. He's unable to take part in almost all of the physical activities he once enjoyed because of a multitude of physical problems and the result of 15 years in the league. My whole family likes to live on the edge of so some of the things I regret that I can't do with them. The four-time Super Bowl champion told USA Today, like snowboarding, I fell like 50 times within 30 yards off the top of the ski lift. I love basketball. I can't play basketball. I can shoot, but that's about it. I can not run up and down the court. My knee just gives out. I tried a little bit of skiing, but unfortunately, when you get weight on one ski under my left knee, it's not very strong. After my first back surgery, what kind of compound things is that my sciatic nerve has been damaged? So the muscles along my sciatic nerve into my left foot have been numb since 86. Montana says he's unable to strengthen his knee despite six surgeries to that area. It's sad, right? They kept saying I'll need a knee replacement when I can't walk. He said I can't really run or do much with it. And that's just one of Joe Montana's many physical ailments these days. He recently had elbow surgery. He's had three neck fusions, and he thinks another one will be necessary soon. He has arthritis in his elbows, knees, and hands, and there's nerve damage in one eye that a doctor told him was from head trauma. 
That's just life after the NFL, Montana. So unfortunately, most of us most of us leave this game with things that linger. The guy is 59 years old. I'm older than him. I am never going to complain again about a stiffness in the hand when I wake up. The most I get is a, a foot a foot lock once in a while and a finger lock. I take no medication. <laughs> I'm telling you, Wimps rule. There's no question about it. It's not to say I'm not active, but I never participated in a sport that was as uh, traumatic to the brain as that sport. Now, this leads us to a question we're not even going to cover on the show today, which is all of the crackpot weaklings in America want to eliminate football because they can't play it, and because they can't play it, they want to eliminate it, just as they're trying to eliminate the military frontline positions because they know they can't compete with the men who are really up front and brave. They want to eliminate it by watering it down to the point which no one, nobody will believe will make us a stronger force. Boxing is another sport. You think a boxer is in good shape at age 40? Well, you know, what do you think the classic picture of the punch drunk uh, boxer comes from? So that's the price that they pay for participating up front in such a sport. But the bottom line is that it's a wimp's world at the end of the day. If you're one of these people who didn't play sports and you're still in good shape, that's why. And if you took vitamins for 40 years, that is another reason you're in good shape. And if you avoided hamburgers and cheeseburgers and especially sugar, which is the worst poison on the planet, the worst of all is not fat. That I wrote about in the 1970s. We all know that. It's the sugar disease. Sugar, 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 sugar disease. But we don't want to go into health right now. We want to talk about this. But one of the reasons I'm happy, and we'll take your calls in a minute on the housing crisis, on what you lost with Madoff, is because I'm not going to the Super Bowl. I'm not going over the bridge. It was like almost a mistake. Tonight after the show... I was going to go over the bridge. See, families in town, they're going to the Super Bowl, a part of the family. Uh, so to celebrate tonight, we were going to go over the bridge and have dinner at one of my favorite restaurants in the city, which, you know, wasn't, that's what, a million people are in the city? I'm going to be like a nut to go. I don't want to go. So I made a decision to stay over on this side of the bridge where I sometimes, I'm going to a local restaurant. I was looking at the local menu. It's like a working kind of guy's restaurant. I'm so happy that I don't have to go over the bridge and put up with the parking and the traffic and the, the uniform, the, the, the waiters, I just don't have to put up with it. This is different. This is different. It's local. It's like the local kind of Italian restaurant that everybody knows from across America. The food is the same for 45 years. Same recipes. And they, a plate of food that can choke a horse. That, that's the kind of food people like. Why do you think the place is full all the time? So I'm thrilled, actually. All I'm thinking about is what I'm going to drink for dinner. What I'm going to eat, I don't care about. <laughs> the truth is I'm not drinking much these days because I'm taking Allegra for my allergies. And once I'm on these uh, uh, antihistamines, forget about it. I don't, even, I don't even crave alcohol. The truth is I have no desire for a drink. Isn't that funny? Anyway, I don't think you're interested in any of this, but I'll t talk about that if you want of what kind of antihistamine. The only kind I will take is the one that has no anticholinergic effects because it doesn't affect my memory. You don't know that, but many of the antihistamines you take do affect your memory very negatively, especially older folks, even over 40, 50, be very cautious what kind of antihistamine you are taking, and in fact, any other drugs that you're taking, because some of them have anticholinergic effects. And what that means is it interferes with um, acetylcholine, and that interferes with your synapse firing. It interferes with your memory transmission. And you, you take some of these for years, and you will wind up with a diminished memory. So I take the only antihistamine that has no cholinergic effects, or anticholinergic effects to be more specific, and uh, it, it just makes me happier, to be very honest with you, to not be suffering from, a, from the pollen attack. It's early this year, my God, from the rains and the this and the that. It's like a nightmare out there. Now let's take some calls about Madoff. But he's enjoying prison, by the way. According to that show, he likes it in prison. This is the thing you don't know. There's a paradox. If you're not in like a hardcore jail, if you're in one of these country club prisons for white-collar crime, and you have like something interesting, you're going to have a lot of friends. He said that every morning he woke up in his life, he was miserable in his guts because he was robbing everyone and he was afraid he was going to be found out. Every morning he had a, in the stomach a pain like a shoot like th and a knife, you know, like you feel in other words every day, the average listener to radio. Every morning you wake up with a terrible feeling in your guts. He said once he went to prison and it got adjusted to it 
And he, he met friends, all of the other swindlers. He said they looked up to him because he was the biggest crook of all. He was the king of swindlers. He said he never felt so good. He plays cards with them. He plays pinochle. He advises them on stock. He has guys to hang out with. The guy's happy. He's also happy he doesn't have to put up with his wife, I'm sure. Imagine that. Imagine having to please Ruth Madoff every day of your life. Anyway, but he's a happy man. That's something you don't know. Frank W. D. G. J. Radio. Go ahead, my friend. What's your story? Uh, I belong to a, uh, an operating engineers union in New York, and uh, we lost fifty million dollars with Madoff. Oh my! But, he took his uh, he took his union for a ride. Yes, but I mean, prior to, prior to him getting arrested, we were we were getting sixteen percent on our money. And any time we, we needed money, it was always there until December 11th when he was in handcuffs. Uh, so he was feeding the Ponzi with the new investors. Right, right. And he, pro and he probably made sure that the unions got it first because he was afraid of you. I don't know if he was afraid. But anyway, so we lost $50 million. We eventually made it up because work has been good up here for the last few years. I mean, I'm really well, he, guy, but he, he took He took a Jewish group, Hadassah, for $90 million, by the way. Oh, sure. He, Not, he took a Jewish group for $90 million. He took one of his oldest friends for f $545 million. Can you believe what this guy did? Oh, yeah. It was uh, one of the biggest... You know, I, I have a question. We understand that there's criminal justice in the prisons. How come he's gotten away with, uh, let us say, skate, having such a good time? He hurt so many people. How does he get away with it? He gets away with it because he didn't, he didn't molest any children. Okay. You mean that's that's really the dividing line? Those are the guys that get hassled in prison, mm -hmm. or if you go in there pretending to be a tough guy. Ooh, oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm sure you get broken down to uh, size in prison pretty quick. Well, that's a sad story. I'm glad you made it up somehow, but didn't uh, take away the pain of, of the fifty million dollar loss. Uh, w. VLK Radio. Rob, go ahead, please. What's your topic? Yes, sir. I was just fascinated uh, whether or not the sons knew about it. You know, the one is so tragic that he killed himself. And that, that piece of scum ought to have a pain somewhere else that knowing that he had a, a hand in killing his son. But I wonder if he knew or if his son just felt so guilty, you know, to his mm. I've thought about it. We certainly don't know. He claims he insulated them by putting them on another floor of the building in which he worked. They ran the uh, brokerage firm arm of the Madoff uh, company. He ran the investment side, which was the Ponzi scheme. Now, he, if, that, if that's true, because they kept saying, we want our names on the building. Why is it your name? Why isn't it called Madoff Securities? And apparently he was very bad to them and said, look, you do your thing. It's my company. I'll do it my way. But looking back, he was trying to protect them from indictment because I don't think they actually knew what the father was doing. They had an investment arm of the firm, rather a uh, brokerage side of the firm that was actually making money on its own legitimately. Well, you know, the, 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 the guys being so intelligent, obviously they were very intelligent. It's just, I don't know. I, I was just, I had a hard time discerning from the show you know, did they really know? Uh... No, I understand. My initial feeling was when this came down, the whole Madoff scam a couple of years ago, it was a long time now, uh, who else in the family knew? I certainly don't believe that a wife wouldn't know what the husband does for a living. I'm sorry. You know, I've seen enough of the Sopranos where they insulate the wife from the crime so she can't be indicted. But you tell me a guy living that lifestyle, making that kind of money, the wife didn't know what he was doing? We had a caller yesterday on this show, The Savage Show, who said that she was actually a sales arm of this guy. She was always the, the charming one. She tried to close the deals herself. I heard that. So, I mean, maybe that answers. And I, you know, the wife, maybe the sons, I don't think so. Okay, my friends, what about the foreclosure issue, which we talked about yesterday? Are there any um, foreclosure horror stories out there? And the reason it's relevant today and it is relevant to today. And the reason it's relevant to this election is because this giant Ponzi scheme of our economy, many experts say, is on the verge of a blowout again. And I, I, I said yesterday, again, guesstimating, it'll happen right after a Republican takes the office uh, next January. It's a game that's played. It's a shill game. Eight years of Dems, and they throw it to Republicans, blow the economy. Or eight years of Republicans, look what Bush did, 
blew the economy, took the cash out of the Ponzi scheme. His friends got very, very richer than, much richer than they were. And then what happened right after that? Bingo, we got Obama, who rescued us.